people, a lot of people are losing. <sighs> um, Dr. Diaz, Stephanie, I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, the thing about your story that I love is that it is so illustrative of how this fast um, the world of cancer treatment oncology is moving. Um, and so I want to kind of step through that story uh, step by step. And so let's start at the beginning. Stephanie, you were diagnosed with late stage colon cancer at the age of 20, uh, or 22 rather. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit about that experience and what happened next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was diagnosed with stage two colon cancer at 22. I have something called Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic disposition to certain cancers, um, colon cancer being one of them. So um, at the ripe age of 22, I just graduated from NYU and was diagnosed with this pretty aggressive malignancy, um, aggressive surgery, and no further treatment was recommended at that time. All my lymph nodes had come back clean. Um, but 10 months later, uh, unfortunately, the cancer metastasized into my abdominal cavity in the mesentery area. At that point, um, you know, when a cancer metastasizes, it obviously automatically becomes stage four disease. So another very um, harrowing uh, surgery, and at that point, chemotherapy was recommended, you know, preventatively just to make sure that all the microscopic cells were, were eliminated if there were any cancerous cells left over. Um, as I'm on chemotherapy, I was on the full FOX regimen, uh, we scanned and it appeared that the cancer come back for you know a third time or perhaps you know never fully went away. So at that point, I was switched over to a more aggressive type of chemotherapy. Again, these are all standard of care for colon cancer, um, and a few months on that treatment, full fo full fury treatment, and the scan showed that not only was the tumor now completely um, inoperable, but there was just nothing left to be done. I mean, it, it was getting more and more aggressive by the, by the day. Mm. So it, within, so I was diagnosed January 2013. Um, so I had surgery January and then again in December. And then by uh, July of 2014, I was sent home well, with, with no further treatment options or options at all. Yeah. So you had, so that's two surgeries, uh, a pair of pretty brutal chemotherapy yeah. uh, treatments, um, and you've gone home, uh, and as I understand it, your sister at the time is sort of like, was your kind of partner in crime been like supporting you through this? Yeah. Uh, then what happens? Yeah, so at, at this point, I mean, I'm barely 100 pounds. I am in an extraordinary amount of pain, and I like to talk about the pain because I don't think many people talk about the pain associated with cancer, which is a big part of that journey, especially when it's such an advanced disease. And my family was so incredible throughout, and specifically my little sister Jess was my champion, and she was my voice when I really didn't have one because I think it's so important to talk about the caretakers and um, the role that they so critically pay, play in, in this journey because I would not be here without her, mm -hmm. quite literally. So I get this news. She's sitting in the, in the doctor's appointment with me, and she will not take um, this no for an answer. She will not um, accept that this is the end of the road for me and goes home and just scours the Internet. And she just looks on clinicaltrials.gov and starts plugging in the buzzwords that we had heard mm -hmm. throughout my journey, you know, MSI, which is microsatellite instability, and all these different genetic components of my cancer. And she finds a trial, and she comes into my bedroom. I'm in a pitch black room, so ready to give up. Um, so tired, and she goes, Steph, I think I found the trial that could save your life. And yeah, that is where <laughs> this part begins. <laughs> and so, and yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, so as I understand, she makes a phone call or something, and at the other end of that phone, or at the, end of the, at the other end of some chain of communication is Dr. Diaz. <laughs> Do you remember hearing from Jess, Stephanie's sister? So it's a little hazy because we got, we got to get our story straight, but uh, yeah. I did call Stephanie, uh -huh. um, and she was actually about to walk in to her surgeon's um, office to get additional news that there was nothing else that they could do. Mm -hmm. And when you fail standard lines of chemotherapy uh, in colon cancer, um, you're measuring survival in weeks. 
Um, and you were a young lady, very young lady, who was on uh, a very high dose of narcotics, had failed all standard care of therapy, and actually the standard of care is to refer patients to a clinical trial or hospice, and that's where you're at. Um, so I called her and she blew me off. She said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going on to this doctor's office. And, uh, and she, call, she called me back afterwards. Yeah, I had gotten a call from a 410 number, which is Baltimore, and he was at Hopkins at the time. And I'm like, Mom, I'm getting this call. What do I do? And she's like, answer the phone. So I answer the phone, and, and he basically, I say the story the same t- way over and over again because I really mean it. He saved my life on the telephone. Um, he said, get down here as fast as you can. We've been having tremendous success with, success with patients like yourself. And that was the light that I needed in that time. I mean, it was a really dark time. And to hear not only the empathy on the other end of the line, but just like, there is hope here and we can do something about this. And we've been having, you know, amazing success. That was yeah. a lifeline to me and, and kept me going through, you know, the month process of transferring, you know, tumor samples and all the sort of procedural things that need to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. Dr. Diaz, uh, you had been having, as uh, Stephanie said, tremendous success with this treatment. Tell us about this treatment. And as I understand, it's part of a larger suite of immunotherapy treatments. Yeah. Um, So this was in in late or early 2010, 2011. There was hints that immunotherapy, a new type of immunotherapy uh, called checkpoint inhibition, was working in diseases like melanoma and lung cancer. Um, But it wasn't working in diseases like colon cancer or pancreatic cancer or or uterine cancer. And what we hypothesized was maybe there's a molecular signature that some tumors carry and that the immunotherapy would work extraordinarily well in those scenarios. So we went to all the pharma companies that were developing these drugs um, and said, listen, this is our hypothesis. Will you support this research? And they all said no. Um, And so we went back and said, well, what if we paid for the study and you give us the drug, you give us access to your drug. And, and they, they all said no except one, Merck. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't have the money. And so we, we initiated the process, uh, but like out of a, from the sky, these philanthropists called Swim Across America decided to fund a study. Um, and these were 500 swimmers that jumped jump in the Chesapeake Bay each year. And we started the study. And Stephanie was one of the first patients on the study. And um, we saw remarkable success immediately. Um, And I've been in this business for some time, and I'll tell you, most things don't work. That's why cancer is so terrible. Most clinical trials fail. In fact, 90% of clinical trials fail. Um, Most patients with metastatic disease die. And so when that is your perspective and you have something that's working, um, it's unbelievable. It's like magic. Um, And Stephanie is, is part of that magic. But not only did we treat the first 12 patients, and 90% of them had a remarkable response. The FDA noticed and granted us breakthrough status alongside Merck. And then within two years, they granted us accelerated approval, not only for colon cancer, but for any tumor type with this molecular signature in adults and children because the efficacy was so strong. And this molecular signature can be found in about 4% of cancers. Um, across the board, and we, we estimated about a half a million people a year worldwide who would previously have had progressive metastatic disease and died can now uh, be saved with this therapy. Uh, and Stephanie is one of those survivors. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Stephanie, tell us something about the experience of the clinical trial. I think there can be a misperception that... Um, that because clinical trials are sometimes a last resort, that mm-hmm. there's uh, that uh, maybe it's it's not the best experience. You don't get the best care. Um, it's certainly a very scary point in your life. Um, how did that whole? Th- I mean, obviously we are delighted to have you here today, so we know <laughs> like you know there's a spoiler at the end of the story. But how did the how did the process work? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, very unfortunately didn't have an option at that point. So it was kind of like you know an enroll in a clinical trial or. Um, give up. And so that's an important distinction to make. However, as I was going through my cancer journey, I had this total misconception that clinical trials were a last resort option or were completely experimental or that I would be a guinea pig. I think most 
people do have that misconception. I think it's one that we really need to start focusing on because that could not be further from the truth. More and more clinical trials are the most precise treatments for a specific type of cancer or you know, genetic subtype or biomarker. And furthermore, when you're in a clinical trial, everybody on that team is rooting for the success of this trial. I've never felt more well taken care of. I'm like under a microscope from this guy, from my <laughs> other phenomenal physician, Dr. Young Lee at Hopkins, um, the, the nurses, the entire team is rooting for this and, and, and really following the protocol so precisely. And um, I am a huge proponent, obviously, for clinical trials to save my life. But I think that more and more people should be looking into them because often, more often than not, they can be better options for patients than standard of care. And especially phase two clinical trials, phase three clinical trials, those have been through um, the most rigorous processes um, to, to show efficacy. Mm. So I'm obviously a, a huge fan of clinical trials and I think um, we really need to be speaking about them more. And, and for also, I, I think it's important to note because the cancer landscape is changing so rapidly right mm. now, it's absolutely incredible. But unfortunately, this um, creates a situation where oncologists cannot keep up. It's not that they mm. don't want to. They, there are some mm. phenomenal physicians out there, but they are taking care of their patients. How could they possibly be uh, you know, keeping on top of, of all of the most recent research? Mm. So I think it's very important, and I try to advocate for this, that patients really become an expert, and I don't mean understand it scientifically and have a PhD in it, but un understand your specific type of cancer and understand the landscape and what is available to you right now because if your oncologist is telling you this is the end of the road, that might be to the best of their, their knowledge the case, but it might not be fact. Hmm. Dr. Diaz, what are you guys doing when, when you have a, a trial that's that successful? Uh, what can you do to really uh, spread the word, to beat the drum so that you know there are more Stephanie's flooding right. into your office? So it's not common that mm -hmm. a trial is this successful. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, um, there are probably only two or three examples in, in cancer of mm -hmm. therapies this successful that are potentially curative. Uh, and even though I threw the word of cure at Stephanie, um, even at, at such an early time point, you know, we're still monitoring you and it's a twice a year process where we get a CT scan and, and see how things are going. The good news is, is that most oncologists are hungry for this type of information. Mm -hmm. um, they're all patients with metastatic colon cancer, unless they can be cured by surgery, get to the point where they failed therapy. Almost all of them, I'd say 95%. And all of them only have the option of giving up or going on a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. This gives some patients another option, but there's a large majority of patients that don't have options. And so we, as oncologists want to try new things. We, we want to offer something to our patients. So when something new like this comes up, the word spreads incredibly fast. Mm. And that's why the mm -hmm. FDA approval is so important. The FDA approval allows us as physicians to credibly give this therapy mm. and allows our partners in pharma and it allows our partners in cooperative groups to begin to educate. But it's a slow process. It's not immediate. Um, and the word, it takes time for it to get out, especially in this situation mm -hmm. where it's just not colon cancer, it's every single tumor. Mm -hmm. Everyone with metastatic disease should be tested for MSI. And that's the genetic marker yeah. that her tumor had. And that's because if your tumor has it, you have an incredibly high likelihood to have a remarkable response, an exceptional, extraordinary response to this mm -hmm. therapy. And um, regardless if you're a pediatric patient or an adult patient, a patient with a brain tumor or with a uterine tumor, all of those have a three or to four percent chance of having this genetic biomarker. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's going to get time. Even the FDA need to get comfortable with that. But I think the fact that they've made this approval so broad really uh, ushers in a new era in oncology therapy. Can you zoom out? for me to immunotherapy more generally. Mm -hmm. um, we see it sort of in the headlines quite a bit. Um, is, is, uh, are stories like Stephanie gonna be more common going forward? Is this, I mean, are, are you seeing lots of other trials that look like this or is this an isolated case? So, so this is an exceptional case, mm -hmm. but certainly immunotherapy has, it is making a huge difference in many different tumor types. 
uh, like melanoma, lung cancer, bladder cancers. And it looks like there's a subset of every cancer that will be responsive to an immunotherapy. Not all of them will result in cure, but they definitely move the survival curve longer and longer and longer. Um, I think that the horizon is very bright in how immunotherapy will be a new avenue for therapy in cancer. Um, and so I'm very bullish that in the next three to four years, we're going to see a lot more stories like Stephanie's. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that cancer will be a very different disease than what we were accustomed to even as little as five to ten years ago. Stephanie, what has your experience been like uh, after having... Uh, traveled this journey, as you call it, um, and come out the other side in, in, uh, in enviable shape. Um, you've had this opportunity to not just hear, but you've become quite a patient advocate and sharing your experience far and wide. Uh, how are people responding to you? Yeah, um, it's been phenomenal. I mean, to be honest, I, I just took a second here to <laughs> pinch myself because I'm, I can't believe I'm sitting here next to you. Um, four years, three or four years later, this is surreal. I mm. cannot believe that I'm here right now. I can't believe how well that I feel. But I also am constantly thinking about the fact that I'm one of very few lucky ones right mm. now. But I also have been very fortunate to be learning about the science from some of these incredible experts. And I know what's on the horizon. I know that it takes patients um, getting involved and being partners of science and partners of research. Um, for us to get where we need to be, but it's phenomenal. I mean, I have my life back. I haven't felt this well in probably over six years. I mean, I was sick a lot longer, you know, a lot longer than I knew that I was sick. Um, and it, it's, it's been great. The reception that I get from people is phenomenal. I try to, um, I know that, again, that I'm one of the most fortunate people on the face of the planet, and I won't stop fighting and advocating mm. until many more people are, are as lucky as I've been. So it's, it's, Okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Diaz, uh, Stephanie, thanks for being with us this, here this afternoon. It's wonderful. Thank you thanks so, so much. Thanks so much. Mm. Take care. Mm. Oh.